sorry for the shuffling. I think actually Dr. Goldman made um, really most of the introduction uh, or transition to this session that needs to be done. So especially mindful of the fact that we've gotten a little bit behind after lunch, I just want to move quickly to introduce our speakers. But to say, just in summary, first of all, I should have introduced myself. I'm Meg Schwarzman. I am an environmental health scientist here in the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley and Associate Director for Health and Environment in the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. So this session is meant to explore the role of the environmental health sciences in, I'm too little for this podium, the uh, computer blocks my view. Um, uh, we want to explore the role of the environmental health sciences in informing green chemistry um, and the, with the sense that uh, there's a role for environmental health sciences in helping understand what is safe, if a goal is to uh, define safer chemistries. And um, I actually won't take the time to, I was going to specifically call out the uh, principles of green chemistry that are m really require the uh, input of environmental health sciences, but I will leave that to our speakers. I would just add that without proposing a 13th uh, um, principle, I would say that there is an element to add from the occupational health perspective that chemists themselves need to understand something about the hazard of the uh, materials that they work with. And um, I think that if we're, if we're doing a transition to green chemistry, that will be built into the safety of chemicals, but it's something that could shape the discussion in a way that hasn't quite uh, yet. And it requires more knowledge than you can gain from the information typically available on MSDS, I think. So we'll begin with remarks from two scientists and thinkers in this area and then move to a conversation between them. First, I'm pleased to introduce John Balbus, uh, who is Senior Advisor for Public Health at NIEHS, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, where he also leads the, institutions, the institute's efforts on climate change and health. His training uh, and experience spans the fields of clinical medicine. He's board certified in internal medicine and occupational medicine. And he also uh, has critical experience in epidemiology and uh, toxicology and risk sciences. He has served uh, as a member of several federal advisory committees with EPA, the uh, Institutes of Medicine, and NAS. He received his MD from the University of Pennsylvania and his MPH from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And before joining NIEHS, he was chief scientist for an NGO environmental defense fund, quite prominent. And he has served on the faculty of the George Washington University, where he was founding director for the Center for Risk, Science, and Public Health. And he maintains a faculty appointment at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, so you can see he really comes from a variety of worlds and brings his expertise. I also understand that yesterday was his birthday. <laughs> Thank you, Megan, for that introduction, and to Megan and to Mike for inviting me to be here today. I'm really excited to be here today, not just because it's the day after my birthday, and, uh, and not at all because I'm speaking in the postprandial lull period where everybody will be nodding off, but I'm going to do my best to prevent that. Um, but I'm excited for two other reasons. One is that uh, it's very exciting for me to have public health be in the same breath as a Green Chemistry Center's inaugural conference. I think that's a clear statement, a strong statement, and a statement that I'm very excited to be part of. Um, I'm also excited to be providing a little bit of geographical diversity to the day uh, to be your token Easterner. And um, even though we are running very late, I'll try not to talk too fast. Um, although people in the Bay Area talk pretty fast, too. Uh, but I, I will, uh, mindful of the time, try to, to go through some very brief introductory slides, primarily intended to give you a sense of what NIEHS as an institute is doing to kind of bring the emerging science and the new scientific advances in toxicology and specifically making a transition from descriptive toxicology to predictive toxicology and how that relates to green chemistry. I'm going to start off with a fairly standard disclaimer. I come from a variety of backgrounds and when I'm talking uh, and, and giving my personal opinions, those are not necessarily the opinions of my home institution, the Department of Health and Human Services or the federal government in general. Um, the NIEHS is unique among the 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health, not just geographically. We're located down in North Carolina, and everybody else is actually where my office is, up in Bethesda. But because we are, uh, the, really, of all the 27 institutes and centers, the one most dedicated to prevention and to public health. So our science is geared towards interventions, prediction, 
to some degree, the sciences of risk assessment, understanding the hazard of chemicals and understanding how people are exposed and how to measure that exposure, rather than trying to figure out when they're sick, patch them up when they're sick, and improve their health um, after major surgery or treatment for cancer or so on. So we have a, a slightly different tack. We're also very different. We're a very complex organization that brings together a lot of different disciplines in one. Environmental health sciences are inherently multidisciplinary, and our institute reflects that. And uh, there are five, you can break us up in a, in a bunch of different ways, but I've just listed five different components, um, all of which have some connection to green chemistry and the green economy. For example, our national toxicology program brings together food safety, occupational health safety, environmental safety, by bringing together all these different um, agencies, um, and is also dedicated to the, the testing of chemicals and understanding the hazards of chemicals and advancing that science and predictive toxicology, and I'm going to talk at a little bit of length about our Tox21 program that's housed there. We also have a Superfund research program, and you may say, well, that's the cat out of the bag, right? You know, that's, that's really not, not green chemistry, but in fact, um, some of that, we have a green chemistry program within the Superfund research program, which is dedicated to greening remediation technologies. You know, we talk a lot about the fact that we, you know, try to clean up one harm and create another, we do that a lot in the remediation process. So part of our institute is looking at the, the processes and the chemicals that are used to do remediation and ensure that they don't create new problems. We also have a very unique worker education and training program um, that gets at the occupational health side of protecting people, of, of applying our knowledge uh, in a very real way to protect the people who are working on hazardous waste sites. I'm going to start my talk here uh, in, in, a, in a fairly... Uh, not, not necessarily all that immediately obvious and informative diagram, but this is from a, a landmark study the, uh, from the National Academy of Science called Toxicology Testing um, in the 21st Century, uh, which came out at the same time as another uh, report that I just want to give a little plug as being part of the, the, this poor stepsister or stepchild of, of, uh, of the National Academy, which was toxicogenomic testing, I'm sorry, toxicogenomics and predictive toxicology two kind of yin and yang reports, two, two different elements of the, of, of the same, um, the same uh, basic set of, of scientific concepts um, that really mark this landmark change from old toxicology, which I'm calling descriptive toxicology, to predictive toxicology. And, and what does that mean? That's a, that's a change from the, the when I learned uh, toxicology many, many years ago, this it wasn't a complex branching kind of diagram, it was a linear diagram. And that linear diagram started with emissions and then went to exposure and dose and then some things happened, a little black box and things happened inside the organism. And then at the far end, you had some kind of clinically observable disease. And in traditional toxicology, what we did was to take whole animals and we would give them high enough levels of chemical that we could be sure to produce some kind of disease at the other end that you could find you know, pathologically taking tissue out, looking at it under a microscope um, in a relatively limited number of animals. You didn't want to have to dose many thousands. You wanted to have a small number of animals for, for human, you know, human, humane reasons, um, but that meant you had to really give very high doses of, of chemicals, often higher than was really the kind of uh, level of exposure that you would see in the real world. The shift in thinking is to a new paradigm where instead of looking at this um, kind of continuum that leads all the way to a clinically observable disease, the focus is on more subtle perturbations of biological systems. And it doesn't sound like much, but it's kind of profound because it means that toxicologic tests now can be much quicker. They can be much cheaper because you're often using, um, instead of using whole animals, which require a lot of cost to maintain, you're using uh, somewhat less expensive systems. You can um, do a whole lot more uh, chemicals at one time. Um, and you can also, instead of using rodents or other kinds of animals, you can actually use human cells or human tissues and not have this issue of trying to extrapolate one from the other. So it's changed things in a lot of ways and it opened up a lot of potential, but it also has significant challenges because you're not making that clear, concrete linkage to actual diseases. You have to really understand what's going on in these very complex human systems and be able to link them with some degree of certainty to outcomes that you care about. And that degree of certainty 
is now opening up a whole different way of thinking about both predictive toxicology but also regulatory policies. And if I had more time, I'd go into more detail about that. But I just want to kind of throw, throw those, those ideas out. And so as an institution, we're looking at this 21st century concept, this change in toxicology, and, and, and trying to address some of these key challenges. Uh, Dr. Goldman referred to, to the, the uh, Human Genome Project and how that's changed our thinking. And a lot of our technology in toxicology is derived from the ability to measure genes and gene products and proteins and metabolites um, in a very comprehensive way. Um, and the question is, how do we take that technology and actually use it to be predictive, to actually be able to have some certainty about what these subtle changes mean? Um, the second thing that we have learned as we've done all of these genomic studies and as we've started to apply them in toxicology is that people are, and, and organisms in general, but humans in, in particular, are very, very variable. And you take two different individuals and you expose them in the exact same way and you don't always get the same thing when you look at this much more subtle um, systems level. And so how do we start to understand the susceptibility and as we're getting this new kind of information, be able to apply that in a way that's really truly productive of the most vulnerable people. Um, the other aspect of this vulnerability is something that Dr. Goldman also alluded to, which is we have a much greater understanding that there are critical windows of susceptibility, in particular very early in, uh, in gestation, throughout the in utero period, throughout the key milestones of infant development, when much lower doses of a chemical can cause these very subtle changes either to um, our genetic material, not the code of the genes, but the coating of the genes, it's called epigenetics, or to other, um, other uh, key kind of systems that don't manifest themselves until later in life. And so these are some of the program and priority areas within the environmental health sciences that we're focusing at NIEHS, um, and I've kind of talked about most of these in one form or another. Um, climate change is, uh, in this case, less it's linked to green chemistry is more in terms of its technology forcing, more the responses to climate change. Um, we're also, as an institute, trying to understand the impacts of climate change as well, but that's not quite apropos of this topic. Um, I'm just going to skip this in the interest of time. That's uh, about a National Academy committee that's asking these very same kinds of questions. I want to just say a few words about our TOX21 program, which is uh, a partnership, and I've, it's, I'm listing names in part because I've stolen their slides. Uh, so I want to at least give them a little credit, but also to show you uh, on the left side between our na the National Toxicology Program, which is housed at NIEHS, the NIH Chemical Genomics Center, which is advancing robotics and the technology to do high throughput screening, the EPA and the FDA. And the goals of this program um, are very much aligned, I'm just going to populate this quickly, uh, with the kind of technology and the kind of scientific understanding that is really needed for this kind of holistic green chemistry program that incorporates predictive toxicology into the design of chemicals, um, you know, especially down at the bottom, this, this working to, to develop these predictive models for biological response using this, this concept of, of subtle perturbations of biological systems. But there are a lot of challenges within this kind of approach, and, and so I, I want to put forward to you that this is an area of, of, of tremendous promise, but it's also an area where we're not quite there yet. We're just at the very, very early stages of being able to take these new technologies, new understandings, high throughput screening, and be able to apply them in a predictive fashion in the way that we need to, to be able to start separating, prioritizing, choosing among alternatives. Um, some of the problem, one of the things that we found is that there's just incredible noise in the system. The more uh, subtle the perturbation you're looking for, the harder it is to reproduce the exact same pattern of perturbation. Um, and we've gone from a situation where you're almost at a yes or no kind of data point. Did the animal develop a tumor? Did it not? That's, that's pretty simplistic. To 10,000 data points at multiple doses um, or even more data points than that, hundreds of thousands of data points creating these complex patterns. And part of the issue is that Human cognition, I don't think, is really up to the task. And so we started developing some, some kind of simplistic visualization tools because we feel like we still need to be able to visualize it and intuitively understand it. But I'm going to put to you that one of the things that has to happen is the advances in the computing side and the bioinformatics side and the you know, parallel computing to be able to decipher some of this complex material. 
Um, the other, there are other issues. Don't have time to get into all the technical details, but what we've, when, we, when we stop these lifelong animal studies, and you know, one of the reasons we've done them is because the life of a, of a mouse is about two years, so we can do a whole lifetime in a, hum, in a reference, in a time frame that's relevant to human scales. When we do this high throughput screening, that's kind of out the window. We're not even dealing with whole animals. We're looking at very short-term responses. And so we have to be able to link those short-term responses to the kinds of changes that lead to chronic responses that's a big challenge, and we're just getting to that. And I'm going to show you a little bit of how we're approaching that. Uh, and I, I've, I think we've, we've touched on some of these critical issues um, in one way or another. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to zip through that. And instead, I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes on that. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I put this up as, as one of those deliberately complex um, uh, uh, slides to show you that we're dealing with complex systems with multiple feedback loops. I think the most relevant thing and the reason I put this slide in is to show you that one of the, the approaches here is to take, to be able to map out these networks, and this is just a part of a network of networks, but all of those different gene products that are uh, in those blue, the blue underlined font are gene products that are measured in the TOX21 program, uh, in the TOX21 screening system. So, you know, it's this very, you know, genome-wide uh, attempt to understand perturbations in a lot of different systems. And, and I'm, I'm, what I'm leading to is, is just to illustrate this point about the complexity of the system and how we as humans try to understand it. So the standard way to, to, to approach this is you go into your ToxCast database and you look at your genes and you get an output like this, which is similarly uh, inscrutable. And this is for just two of those gene products, but it, it shows you, you know, for buried in there is something that says if you give it a little bit, you get this much response. You give it a little bit more, you get that much response. That's what the output looks like. It's gene by gene. You, nobody can make sense of it in this way. So one of the things that we're working towards is, is um, something that showed up in an earlier form. You may recognize uh, the pattern here. Um, and it's called ToxPi. Uh, and this, this concept was developed by a contractor for EPA's ToxCast program. And um, what we saw earlier today was kind of the most high-level generic form of ToxPi, where we were putting together public perception and a little bit of toxicology and a little bit of persistence in the environment and a little bit does it get in the water. Um, and this is almost the opposite extreme. You can do the same thing and do these color-coded, size-coded pie charts for the gene products that are perturbed. And you can be selective. So you can put you know, 10 different gene products that are all in the same kind of network and put them next to each other. And then the next slice is another 10. Um, and this is showing that same pathway and how um, different chemicals that have been put through have perturbed um, different elements of that insulin um, signaling pathway. And, and what you see is that some of the chemicals tested have lots more pi associated with them. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, PFAS, uh, one of the chemicals tested, had a lot of different elements, uh, and there's suspicion of, of the, the perfluorinated compounds affecting metabolic regulation. So just one example of how we're, we're trying to start taking this very complex information, and this isn't leading to definitive conclusions about an outcome, but at the very least, in product design, as we are starting to have to sort between A and B, this kind of information can start to be used. And one of the things that I hope we can talk about is, you know, the, look, looking at the, the, the uh, application of these kinds of technologies in the pharmaceutical industry, where they've been developed for a long time and have been used, you know, in a system where there's multiple screening of alternatives, uh, and they've been working on that for a while. So. Um, the, the last point I, I, I want to make here is, um, just very briefly, the NIHS does provide a, a unique kind of venue for this work because it's not just about the robots and it's not just about the genetic assays. We're still in the phase where we nearly, really need to be taking these tools and bringing them into human epidemiologic studies and applying them and doing molecular epidemiology to start to make sense out of the variation out of the human susceptibility and to be more confident that we're actually linking these subtle perturbations to and understanding what are the disease outcomes and, and what are the cofactors, the cumulative risk factors that actually lead to people getting sick. And so um, 
by having all of these different components within one house, we're, we're providing a good venue for that. So um, with that, I'm going to close but with one last plug, which is that I want to let you all know that NIEHS is actually embarking on a strategic planning process. We're just getting going. We're just at the phase where we're taking big visionary ideas. I think this is the kind of room where there probably are some big vision, visionary ideas lurking. Um, and we have a website that is open. You can log on to it and um, write a couple of sentences. You know, I think that green chemistry needs to be a big part of the next 10 years, whatever that idea is. Also to nominate people who you think should be part of some of the workshops that we're putting together to actually craft the strategic plan. So I urge you to take a look at that. And with that, I will stop. Thanks. Much, John. So we're actually going to have our two speakers in a row and then gather them for conversation and questions together. Um, so I'll just introduce to you our second uh, speaker in the session, Dr. Jerry Poggi. He's a toxicologist and chemical safety consultant, and he's a founding board member of the U.S. Chemical Safety, uh, chemical safety and Hazard Investigation Board, also known as the CSB Chemical Safety Board. Uh, in that uh, role, he was on the scene at many investigations of explosions, fires, accidents at uh, industrial workplaces. And prior to joining the board, he's had some similar roles as Dr. Balbus. He directed international programs and public health for the NIEHS and has also served on the National Academy of Sciences Board on Chemical Safety. Uh, sorry, Chemical Sciences and Technology, of which uh, Bob Bergman is a current member. And um, in likewise, uh, oh, sorry, finally, in one personal note, in his home county of Fairfax, Virginia, Dr. Poggi serves with organizations working on eliminating poverty and homelessness, work that has garnered him the Fairfax County uh, Human, right Com Human Rights Commission's Human Rights Award. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Poggi. So, I don't know how I get this to be full screen and not presentation for me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's an honor to follow all the luminaries who have preceded us, me today. Uh, we had this working perfectly three times. <laughs> so we're not focused as well as I would like for the presentation. But what I wanted to do today is to give a little bit of an emphasis on environmental health drivers. I think we've talked around the issues of environmental health. Lynn brought up some very important uh, good points about the concerns that lie out there that will influence how we proceed upon the greener chemistries. Um, <laughs> and let me see if I can. Uh, <laughs> Try view. Oh, okay. <laughs> slide on, slide on. John is a hero. Anyway, so quickly looking at the drivers, then getting into technological development, and then we'll talk about and in conversation. So what you're looking at as a backdrop is a picture of Monacougan Lake in Canada. It's an impact crater from something that occurred about 212 million years ago, changing forever the aspects of life on the planet. And I want to talk about the quadruple threats that are all interrelated, so you can't tease them out 100%, and get us thinking about where we are in time and place, and perhaps how to accelerate the urgency with which we embrace the new paradigm of green chemistry. So from a population vantage point, you know, I was born way back in 1950, 2.5 billion people on the planet, Imagine what I've lived through and what we are all living through. This is just the most spectacular epidemic growth of a species on the planet 
that pretty much defines an enormous amount of the problems in material usage. Currently, uh, this January issue of National Geographic said this year we will hit 7 billion people heading north. What does that mean in terms of gross world product? If we think that this is an indicator of material usage on the planet, well, when I was born, way back, when Elizabeth Taylor's movie, uh, The Father of the Bride, just came out, a little around $7 trillion for um, gross world product. We're now getting close to 70. That's a tenfold increase. Our population was increasing approximately 2.8-fold, tenfold increase in consumption of resources. Let's just take one important aspect of that, the vital statistics of fossil fuel consumption. So when I was born, we were at the level under 1950. We are now exceeding the level of 2007. It's not relevant to really keep on updating it. It's only moving in one direction, folks. Um, that is about a six-fold increase in the consumption of fossil fuels. What do we think happens to consuming those fossil fuels? What do you think has been done with them? They've been combusted. And so if we look at James Hansen's analysis of climate forcing, we have a wonderful time machine that kind of went back almost... 800,000 years, and it's called the Vostok Ice Core, two miles down in the Arctic. And you could track through that and other markers what the temperature was and what the forcings were of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane primarily. And lo and behold, the pattern of glacial period, interglacial period, glacial period, interglacial period, was went on for this amount of time pretty much with a boundary of about carbon dioxide going from 190 to about 280 parts per million. Combine all of those current greenhouse gases. Does the system respond instantaneously? Of course not. Because the time scale here is really looking over 100 years. Um, what do we expect is going to happen? Well, all the evidence is indicating we're moving towards warming. Um, does that have real ramifications? But last year was a fascinating one. We had floods beyond belief. The Indus River in, the Pakistan, in Pakistan had an unprecedented monsoon. Doesn't matter what seed you would have had planted there, whether it was the most progressive one that DuPont could have produced, the production doesn't occur. 17 million acres of prime agricultural land was lost for that growing season. We also have droughts and fires because some parts are deluged and other parts are heated up to the point where the trees are tender and fires get started. So here's the droughts and fires in Russia. Russia halted grain exports through 2011. Number three grain exporter. The Environmental Working Group just produced this a few weeks ago, looking at food price rise and impacts with cereal imports for the few net exporters, but the Net imports over a thousand million tons, a billion. What are the nations that are in that situation? China, India, Indonesia. Do you know what the accumulated populations of those three nations are? So when we talk about agricultural productivity and the future of new seed stocks, we have problems that are on our doorstep right now that are, watch what the prices of food are in the United States this coming year. Um, species extinction. These, this time scale is 
million years before the present. So if you walk back from where we are at the moment, way back, there have been at least six major extinctions. These are um, families of marine uh, invertebrate organisms. Back in the uh, Ordovician, Silurian, in the Carboniferous, in the end of the Permian, here's the Manifugan Lake, Triassic, Jurassic point. Here's what we all know, the dinosaurs ended. And uh, uh, geologists are now defining our time as the Anthropocene, with extinction rates every bit as extreme as this. Every bit as extreme. <coughs> so into this envelope of environmental problems, we now have technology and change at a rapid pace. So let's look at the planetary innovations of green chemistries caused by the life on the planet. Primitive cells starting out about two billion years ago, planet is four billion, changing the, climate, the atmosphere of the planet. Body plans develop more complex, Mammals arrive on the scene, primates, humanoids, and then our cells. Our cells change the dynamic from purely biological to tools and culture. And you look over the period of 10,000 years, stone tools, 1,000 years, iron, printing, look at the rate and the pace of change that's occurring on the planet from our species. Uh, Ray Kurzweil just down the road would argue that we're approaching a singularity point when the technological change is so rapid and profound it represents a rupture in the fabric of human history. How do we see it? Well, I started out in 1980 with my first computer, an Apple IIe with that antiquated processor of, you know, what having a equivalent to about 100,000 transistors. Look where we are right now. Everybody in this room has one of these handheld devices, which Kurzweil would say is greater than the capacity had in the supercomputer at uh, MIT when he was one of the few acolytes in that high temple of technology. And price performance is only increasing. So we have technology coming at us so rapidly that we can move from 1950 in understanding DNA for the first time to two, 60 years later. We anticipate that we will have, for the price of an MRI, soon the ability to have our own individual genomes decoded. What does that mean? Well. It affects all that John raised with genomics, proteomics, epigenetics. We are on the cusp of a flow of information that's going to be so rapid, we're going to need machine intelligence to help us decipher it. Leroy Hood in the Center for Integrative Biology says we're on the cusp of the P4 medicine, medicine that will be predictive, preventive, personal and participatory. So are you ready to interpret your own genome? What will you need to know to be able to do that? What will you need to be able to tell your children about that? And what will you need to know to tell your children about that in conjunction with additional information, as was described earlier, um, about the number of chemicals also found in our bodies? Maybe found in our, the fetus of our child. And maybe found the infant in our cord blood. Um, we, we are not yet intelligent enough to understand this, but the problems are here confronting us. I want to be hopeful because I think this community is an authentic sign of hope. But it only can be hopeful if it understands and integrates the kind of information 
that preceded this. So, thanks. I feel like my license plate when I got went through security at the airport. <laughs> Great. Um, so I want to start with a question that's um, focused on what some of John said, but please have both of you um, answer it or get into conversation about it. You referred to the move from bi binary toxicity information, is the animal dead or alive, does it have a tumor or not, to these more complex pictures of altered biological responses. You've written in the past about what some of the barriers are to using that kind of information to really serve the public good. Where would you say we are with that? What are those? How are we doing? What do we need to make it serve the public good? First, in case there are any toxicologists in the room, let me say that the binary thing was a bit of an oversimplification. <laughs> uh, but um, conceptually, it, you know, it, it, the, the point was was a clinically observable, obvious effect in a whole animal versus querying uh, individual receptors or, or genes in response to to, to some kind of uh, intervention. So, um, in terms of where we are, you know, I, I think that. Um, between the time when I was raising those kinds of issues, which was about 2003, 2004, and where we are now, we've um, had two things happen. One is, is another layer of complexity uh, with the discovery of, of, of these, uh, the influence of these epigenetic changes, these inheritable but environmentally, in, uh, it's not just chemical environment, there are many different things, including, as Lynn said, uh, you know, the nutritional environment of the womb uh, and stress and other things can influence the epigenome. But there's this whole layer of complexity of the regulation of genes that wasn't apparent at that point. Um, and then at the same time, we've uh, embarked and started looking at the data and doing these kinds of experiments and finding that there are tremendous issues of replication and you know, tremendous sensitivity to the whole assay to initial conditions. And it's just a whole lot more complicated than we even thought. So um, you know, I, I think that. Um, uh, one of the concerns that we raised a while ago was that uh, to the extent that, that a, a test at that early level you know, might not show tremendous amount of changes, that that kind of information would be used to uh, exonerate a chemical and say it had no hazard when in fact had a different test been done you know, just because of the complexity. That, I don't see that happening. I, I see the, kind of the opposite, that, that there's so much signal, there's so much response that we're just having problems with interpretation, with, with making sense of it. Um, you know, the, the whole area of, of, of biomarkers, you, both Jerry and I refer to this idea that you need superhuman intelligence to be able to interpret it. The field evolved from a, a, a setting of trying to identify you know, the one gene, the one biomarker that really told you something. And we have a great list of those, the, the BRCA genes. You know, it's not to say that you can't use that more reductionistic approach for certain kinds of systems. But it, it looks like other kinds of important disease systems, like our metabolism, you know, the, the obesity, diabetes, metabolism system, there's a lot of entry points into that, and there may not be the same kind of single gene uh, biomarker. So we haven't made a whole lot of progress. We butt up against this, this, this informational, <laughs> computational challenge. Um, we're, we're extracting new kinds of useful information in, in, a, in a linear fashion, but we haven't made that kind of hyperspace leap. What do we need to be able to make that, that the kind of information that's coming out of ToxCast or Tox21 inform green chemistry? Or do you have thoughts? I, I, I think that that's kind of a, if you see the Tox21 or the Next Gen Toxicology Program uh, with EPA, that's kind of the, perhaps the negative side of what are we learning about chemicals. There has to be the obverse side of that as well. You know, I think there's, the information is information that potentially has broad utility. So from drug development, there's pursuits of how do we better understand the human biology 
in all of its fullness that we're now coming to comprehend? And how do we apply that to thinking about drug for positive health enhancement intervention? That whole side of the field is a partner, if you will, with the, the Tox 21 and the next gen toxicology. I think what we're trying to do right now is calibrate from our historical approach to hazard assessment with all of the newer systems that are high throughput, whether, whether it's in silicon or whether it's actually in pieces of cells or tissues, um, we want to be able to know well what we've understood is toxic from past classical methods of toxicological assessment to be affirming that the newer techniques, which will be high throughput and potentially available to a much larger array of chemicals, is going to have at least some touchstones that would tell us this is applicable and should be a good predictive indicator. I, I want to make sure we're, we're understanding. We want to, I would be advocating we see it in two realms. One is in the development of new chemistry and chemical processes, which is sorting through the potential information and picking the winners. And then there's the other side that Lynn was raising, the regulatory side. How do we go back now and recalibrate for chemicals that have ostensibly been grandfathered under the Toxic Substances Control Act, for which we really need to put on an equal footing with potentially new chemistries that will be more assuredly known to be better. But when human knowledge about how we work is never going to end. I kind of liked um, Dr. Grubb's comment this morning about how well the, the theoretical models are becoming based upon deeper knowledge and insights into how to develop models. And so I think we're growing in parallel in the field of toxicology to be better modeling the human system and applying it hopefully more rationally and in a more accelerated way towards uh, safer approaches to chemistry. You brought up, John, the issue that Jerry just um, alluded to, which is the use of the science that's um, generated within the pharmaceutical uh, industry in terms of screening chemicals for drug targets or screening them for toxicity. It sounded like there was more you wanted to say about that. One of the ideas in, in, that was in that sister study of the National Research Council on Predictive to Toxicology and Toxicogenomics and is also uh, part of the Next Gen program, which is a risk assessment, kind of the Next Gen risk assessment to kind of be the component, the, the uh, let's get into my downtime, get into the, the, the partner to the Next Gen 21st century toxicology, um, is the idea that in, in a screening setting, in, if, if we're not looking at existing chemicals that have a market where there is this huge economic uh, issue in, in implicating it as causing harm, and uh, you know, you could argue that the degree of certainty of that implication has to be very, very high. Um, the pharmaceutical industry has, for many years, taken a suite of hundreds and hundreds of chemicals and done computer modeling and come up with all different kinds of variations in chemicals, and then run them through screening processes to be able to figure out which are the ones of higher and lesser risk not saying that the ones of higher risk are clearly going to cause harm, but just they have to make business decisions and, and, and being able to sort these things out. And so what there is is a tiered system in, in pharmacologic uh, screening. You know, the first is, is this in silico kind of uh, structure activity relationships, and then they've been exploring the use of, of some of these uh, toxicogenomic technologies and high throughput screening technologies um, for many years, and then ultimately you know, you have to go through animal studies and then into to human clinical trials. So um, that model is something that we need to look at, and I think we are looking at in the next gen, is how can we use this kind of preliminary information in a screening sort of way, either in a, you know, in a, to, to, to parallel green chemical design and development of new chemicals in a similar way to assure the safety that the pharmaceutical industry does with pretty good success. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also to... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my chance at the end of the day here. Um, but, but also to, to, to make a, a, screen, a tiered assessment to figure out which chemicals need more intensive and, and expensive testing. Mm -hmm. 
Before we take a couple questions from the audience, I just want to um, go from the small scale of high throughput and in silico and cell-based testing to something that you've been intimately involved with, Jerry, which is that this is the 27th anniversary of uh, Bhopal. And um, <coughs> certainly the, I think that everybody knows what it was, the catastrophic release of methyl isocyanide in India. Uh, an accident that killed or injured uh, thousands of people. Um, you were a uh, young professor at University of Miami, or uh, Miami University in Ohio at the time. Um, what have we learned from that? Where are we now? There's an interesting development in the last week with bio crop sciences. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. At that point in time, there was a green, so-called green revolution anticipated in India. Union Carbide Corporation had a major partnership with the state of India to develop a pesticide manufacturing operation, central India, in a place called Bhopal. And one night in December, um, 30, 000, an estimated 30,000 plus pounds of methyl isocyanate went whoosh into the night. And a very large population, a dense population of fence line residents were unaware of what was happening with this toxic gas cloud in their midst. An estimated 8,000 died in the, immediately in the night, 20,000 over the next several months from injuries unaffectively treated, 300,000 injured. The worst industrial disaster, chemical disaster that we know. It propelled policy changes that I think are important to this audience. The Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Law of 1986, a law which created the first computer accessible database of industrial emissions. Henry was talking about a major effort at DuPont in 94 to define a whole bunch of environmental goals and parameters. Some of them were associated with risk reduction methods of reducing the amount of environmental pollutants going to air, water, and soil. So, you know, the terrible tragedy did have a phoenix-like resurgence in better planning and policy. In fact, the whole process safety management paradigm developed out of an industrial <coughs> response that later became codified in law ultimately helping to create the Chemical Safety Board, which I populated for two terms. Um, it's very painful to me that six months after Bhopal had occurred in Texas, a DuPont facility, anticipating there would be severe and maybe terminal interruption to their receipt of methyl isocyanate, put their heads together on how could we preserve the final product, methyl isocyanate was a highly reactive intermediate, how could we get the final product by different means? They developed an inherently safer approach that actually produced in a just-in-time way an amount of material that posed some risk to the few workers that might be in its immediate vicinity of a few feet if it ever broke containment. But the fence line community had no, or no such kinds of risks. It was only a week ago that we actually had Bayer Crop Science announce that they were finished with methyl isocyanate production in high volumes under high intermediate storage. Same approach towards material usage, clearly a much better paradigm of management of it, but decided to retire that out. How does that, what does that tell us about innovation in the whole arena of inherently safer approaches? I, I just wish I had an idea of how we could liberate the inventiveness of this community to work with others to accelerate that process. What are the barriers that exist in the business model towards making change, and how do we overcome it? Because I've had too many tragedies that I led investigations into at the Chemical Safety Board for which we would have been much advantaged to have had an inherently safer approach, auditing partnership with universities and smart business people on how to do it better. We're desperate for that. Those would have saved jobs in those very communities that lost everything. 
one of the things I heard you saying about that is that in six months somebody had an inherently safer way to do what we, what was done right. in Bhopal, and yet it, that same thing was still being done until last week. Um, well, and, and there was a facility and institute that actually went through several different corporate hands, so it's hard to say how, how much time do you need to have in command of the operations in order to think about changing the operations. So that may also be a merger acquisition question that speaks largely to what is our society going to do to protect the broader public interest on doing things better. And that's just one domain. I, you know, I tell John Warner that he misnumbered the whole principles, that number 12 is actually number one, but I think that's an example where there are NIEHS has a super fun basic research program. Martin Smith here is a leader in that community. About $20 million a year since 1986 devoted towards research in how to remediate super fun sites. Very important social function. But if we had to ask ourselves, has the American society invested a similar amount of capital into early intervention with existing businesses to avoid the development of a super fund prospectus? I have to say the answer is no. And despite my appeals to many, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I would just point out that the investment of the super fund research program is not solely in remediation and is in I, fact, I in many cases, I, understanding the hazard I, side, which I can be applied back, so I, I, I agree, apply for I agree, the record. I agree. But the point is still well taken yeah. about getting on the front side as, 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 as I agree. Yeah. Should we have a couple questions? Hi, Melanie Marty from Cali PA. Thank you for the presentations. So I'm going to ask a really hard question. Given that green chemistry is trying to get us to move towards safer chemicals, we have to be able to figure out what are safer chemicals. We have so many chemicals in commerce we know either a lot about because they were of academic interest to somebody, or we know next to nothing about. This includes newer chemicals after the grandfathered Tosca chemicals, because to be honest, the EPA screen for new chemicals, the company is not required to provide toxicity testing in the pre-manufacturing notice. So EPA has very limited tools. They can look at the structure. They have a limited number of QSTAR models they can apply. But it does not tell you a lot about the toxicity of those newer chemicals. So even though they have the opportunity to say, slow down, they can't do that forever. And they don't get the information they need. Tox 21, as you've pointed out, it's, it's great, I'm really glad it's going, but in my view, it's 10, 20 years out before we can really get a lot of good data from high throughput screening. So in the meantime, what do we do from a policy perspective? How, is it, does it make sense to go back, prioritize the Tosca chemicals, and then ask for traditional toxicity testing on many of the high volume chemicals. How do, we, how do we do this from a policy perspective while waiting for all the Tox 21 stuff to happen? <laughs> I just saw a finger flash. Um, and of course, I, I represent a research institution and not a regulatory or policy-based institution. So I'll answer that perhaps from my experience working on the HPV program and the, uh, the children's uh, um, you want to say what they Not the GPAC, program. the, the uh, right, I'm sorry, the VSEP program. Thank you. I, it's four o'clock. Doesn't matter what time zone I'm in. Um, <laughs> you know, there is no easy answer, obviously, or else you would not have asked the question. It's 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 a it's a question of incrementalism, I think, from a public health approach. We want to look at um, you know those chemicals that you know based on a priori criteria or data, we, we think the most vulnerable populations are exposed to. So the, the approaches that we've had of starting with products to which children are likely to be exposed, especially during critical windows of, of susceptibility. And we have to start with prioritization schemes because it's a question of very scarce resources 
and more expensive testing. And um, you know, I think that fundamentally, as, as Lynn pointed, Dr. Golan pointed out very, very eloquently, we're kind of hamstrung in actually doing something um, under the current criteria because there is this catch-22 that until you can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that the chemical is harmful, the EPA is unable to require testing on the chemical. Um, and so I'm not sure that we're 10 to 20 years out. I think that there is an incremental area here. I think that we will have opportunities to do a little bit of apple-to-apple -apple comparison if we can use, you know, if we can have relatively inexpensive high throughput screening methods and a, take a, a new candidate chemical and take its alternative, run it through the same tests. There is information there. We're, we, we're not going to be able to conclude exactly what each one does, but there is at least some kind of comparative basis. How that fits into a regulatory framework versus, you know, within an industry product development model, it's probably much more the latter than the former. And, you know, I think that academic institutions probably have a role in, in pioneering frameworks and, and, and uh, you know, approaches to doing that. So that's kind of a question that Henry raised today in his presentation. You know, DuPont obviously has a vested interest in trying to understand a larger panoply of potential adverse impacts associated with particular chemicals, and then overlay upon that the actual usage of those chemicals in the final product and its usage and disposal in society, or as an intermediate in somebody else's development and you know makes judgments about whether that's too high a risk or too or sufficient and that model needs to be explored hopefully with more public discourse as how it could become a better known paradigm for many companies to be using uh, I, 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 as John said there's no real simple answer to this we'd love to have a magic regulatory wand that says yes and no, uh, but life is much more complex than that is. We have one final question. So this is sort of a general question on, um, like, I don't know whether it should be addressed more to Dr. Goldman or you guys, but whoever wants to pick this up is fine with me. Um, you know, one of the things that people haven't mentioned is that even though, <clears throat> you know, there are all these uh, diseases we can detect, you know, there are cancer clusters, there are all of our friends getting sick, at the same time we see life expectancy going up a little bit every year, at least in this country. It, it, you want to comment on what the reason for that is? Are we just, um, you know, I was sort of struck by Dr. Goldman's comment that, you know, in terms of health you want to keep people not just alive but, you know, really feeling better in, in sort of global terms. But are we just keeping sicker people alive longer with our massive health insurance, you know, uh, system? Or is there something else going on that sort of has this contradictory data happening? So, so there's a lot of drivers of longevity. The first part of the answer is that, in fact, longevity is probably peaked and is starting to go down. And it's probably, and it's not, not primarily because of cancer from chemicals. I, the role of chemicals is to be debated, but it's primarily because of the obesity epidemic in this country and associated diabetic complications and, and cardiovascular complications. The reason for the great increase in longevity up until now has been multifactorial. Uh, it's been changes in, in, and you can look at the rates of cancer and they're going up and down and a lot of it's been driven by cigarette and tobacco use, a lot of it's been driven by early life nutrition, a lot of it's been driven by, um, by, by uh, vaccinations. vaccinations and by food preserving technologies and refrigeration. So, so it's a, there's a lot of things that, that all go into it. And, and again, from a public health standpoint, we know that uh, when things are going down over time, like um, you know, stomach cancer is, has been going down, there's probably an environmental cause. And when things are going up over time, you know, the genetics aren't changing so much. So in the, you know, in, in the course of this overall increase in longevity. We have epidemics of obesity. We've had an epidemic of asthma. We have an epidemic of neurodevelopmental disorders. We have epidemics of leukemia, uh, certain types, brain cancer, esophageal cancer. So um, we would have really much better longevity had we figured out what was causing all of these different uh, kinds of complications. So it's, it's um, you know, 
the, the thing that correlates the best, as we know, with uh, life expectancy, you know, isn't chemicals, it's not even really tobacco, it's, it's per capita income. And that's the other reason why longevity has gone up. In any country where the income goes up, you'll see the longevity go up as well. I mean, I can, I can also add to that. Um, I mean, I think you did put your finger on something, which is that there's a tendency for us to talk about life expectancy, but there are other measures that are important as well. So we can look at average life expectancy, which is very much influenced um, in, in, the, in the last century by the reductions in death by infectious diseases, especially to young people, but really throughout the lifespan. And um, there's a very powerful increase in life expectancy when you prevent people from dying young because um, that has a major, major impact. And so, I mean, most of us have never experienced losing a child, you know, and two centuries ago, maybe most of us would have had a child in our immediate family who would have died. And so that's amazing. Also, um, women and maternal mortality, in a lot of the parts of the world, this is not the case, but it's almost unheard of in, in the U.S. and Europe for women to die, die in childbirth but that is a very common cause of death historically and still in much of the world. And again, because women of childbearing age are young, that has a major impact on life expectancy. And so I think that the major drivers have been through some very basic public health things like sanitation and you know, safer childbirth, um, having you know, attended deliveries. Um, and, and in fact, many of the gains happened before there were even antibiotics and vaccines on the market. So arguably, most of it was not, without even the benefit of pharmaceuticals. Now, um, it is true, though, that uh, we keep seeing these gains in life expectancy, and a lot of that is by keeping people alive. And then I think we have to pick it apart a little bit and look at subgroups in the population, because those benefits have not been equal to all people in our population. Uh, minorities do not have as good a life expectancy as whites in the United States. The poor, as, as Dr. Balba said, as, as those who are better off. Um, frankly, you know, workers in certain occupations have lo lower life expectancies because of the stresses and the exposures that they have. And, and so when we can learn from those things about the environmental things that continue to be a problem, um, most of those things are not genetic. And it is true that many of us do believe that we will see a decline in life expectancy because of this emergent epidemic of obesity. I mean, we, you know, a, a third of our population is not just overweight but obese. And then the children, the rates in children, which we're not seeing in the past, and we don't know how that's going to impact their rates of chronic disease, but it can't be good. And so, I mean, those are things that, um, that are kind of pushing in the opposite direction and have to do with many aspects of health, obviously. Yeah, I'm tempted to ask you about the life expectancy of chemists, but I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> do you want another, do you want a one hour lecture? <laughs> Physical or synthetic? <laughs> so we'll get to finish this conversation uh, a bit more on the panel that we'll have at the end of the day. But for now, I hope you'll join me in thanking Dr. John Baldwin.